Hi, my name is Michael Santos, and I'm the founder of Prison Professors. And every day we like to provide content that will help all justice-impacted people, regardless of what stage of the journey they're in. Now, sometimes we like to really help people look very far down the road, and that's not always easy to do, particularly if somebody has not yet gone to prison. If somebody hasn't gone, if somebody, if, if authorities have charged a person with a crime, but the person has not gone through the pre-sentence investigation, has not been sentenced, they don't really know how to think about all these factors that are going to follow in the weeks, months, years, and sometimes decades ahead. So as somebody who did 26 years in prison, I have a responsibility to try and show people what can I do today to begin preparing a pathway for the best possible outcome. Now, some people just want to outsource all of those decisions to their attorneys, and that's a prerogative. But as, as, as a person who's really seen a lot, I really want to help individuals understand what can I do to stop feeling as if I am a marionette puppet with other people pulling the strings of my life and, 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 and one day pulling this string and my leg moves and this, this string and my arm moves, right? We have got to figure out how do I influence a better outcome. And I want to really emphasize what I am learning in working in the advocacy space is the importance of developing a comprehensive release plan, one that is iterative. And so today's blog, which is published on our website, but also what I distribute to people in jails and prisons across America, really tries to give some, some um, or prompt some ideas on how to develop a release plan. So let me go ahead and read from the blog. For those of you who are listening on iTunes or watching on YouTube, I would encourage you to go to the Prison Professor's website. If you can't find the blog, just go to the search bar and type in criminogenic risk factors or release plan. And you will see the different articles and so on that we, that we publish. But I'm going to share my screen and, and start reading on the plan itself. So <clears throat> in this era of the First Step Act, people going through the criminal justice system will want to pay close attention to the way that the Bureau of Prisons or other agencies will expect their staff members to assess a person's readiness for relief. Through my advocacy work, I have learned that administrators put a lot of emphasis on criminogenic needs. But what is a criminogenic need? Well, scholars define criminogenic needs as follows. Criminogenic needs are factors in an offender's life that relate to a person's propensity to recidivate or face more problems with the criminal justice system. Researchers identify six factors that relate to a risk of criminal behavior. Those factors include low self-control, antisocial personality, antisocial values, criminal peers, substance abuse, and dysfunctional family. Now remember, we don't want to think about these concepts from the way that we see ourselves, nor do we want to consider this concept of criminogenic needs from the perspective of people who know and love us. When we are contemplating the concept of criminogenic needs, we need to begin from the concept of people who work in the corrections trade. Those people hold positions of authority and have enormous discretion over the lives of people in jail or prison. Directly or indirectly, they include probation officers, judges, administrators who preside over prison designations, administrators who preside over custody and classification, administrators who provide over halfway houses and home confinement, administrators who provide over eligibility for program participation, and administrators who have authority to grant liberty, or administrators who determine where a person will work, administrators who can determine whether to advocate on behalf of a person with a criminal record, or people who will make judgments based upon what they read in government or media reports about a person convicted of a crime. To consider such people, we have got to disengage from the way we view ourselves. Typically, people don't believe that prison is an appropriate response for their behavior. And the people who know them best don't think prison is the appropriate response. But we're not necessarily writing a release plan for people with this perspective. We write release plans from the perspective of people who have enormous discretion over our future. So we've got to learn to consider different perspectives. Participants who have read my work previously know that I like to quote authors who had an influence on changing the way that I think. 
While going through 26 years in prison, I read voraciously. At the start of each year, I'd set goals of how many books that I intended to read. Then, as I advise others to do, I wrote book reports to describe why I read the book, what I learned from reading the book, how the book would influence my prospects for success upon release. Those books helped me to consider different perspectives. One author, Seth Godin, wrote a concept about the purple cow. Mr. Godin wrote to influence corporate marketers. He wanted those people to stop thinking about their products or services from the perspective of the brands they represented. Rather, he wanted marketing professionals to think about the perspective of people who would purchase the product. What did they think? Well, when building a release plan, we should follow this same advice that Mr. Godin gives to his audience. It is not important what we think. We have got to think about our audience. Who are they? What do they think about us? How can we influence them? Since we're thinking about people that will have enormous discretion over our life, we have got to consider them as being people of influence. Typically, those people do not go into law enforcement with this concept of wanting to help people in prison. That isn't in their nature. In their view, helping a person in prison may be synonymous with being soft on crime or being sympathetic to the criminal and hard on the victim. These are not my words, but this is the mindset of people that will judge you. Writers like Seth Godin helped me to appreciate this conundrum of being a justice-impacted person. To further the analogy, he told us to imagine driving down the highway. If we viewed a pasture populated with a thousand head of cattle, we wouldn't pay attention. We are so used to seeing cows that we simply keep driving, ignoring the cows because they all looked the same. But if anyone saw a purple cow, he wrote, those people would pause to look and consider the purple cow. How did it get that way? While going through 9,500 days in prison, I understood that in the eyes of people who worked as stakeholders of the system, I was simply a purple cow. I, I meant to write, I was simply a cow. People didn't see me as anything different from all the other cows in the system. I was number 16377-004. So unit team. I will always remember the first time I went to a unit team meeting. It was back in the 1980s. Ronald Reagan was still in the White House. We frequently saw the First Lady, Nancy Reagan, on television talking about her Just Say No campaigns during the war on drugs. All that messaging influenced the way that staff members considered people like me. A jury had convicted me of selling cocaine. A federal judge sentenced me to serve a 45-year sentence. Administrators in the Bureau of Prisons deemed it me an appropriate candidate for placement in a high-security U.S. penitentiary. I had never been to prison before, and I didn't know anything about the prison system. I didn't know how to influence the system or influence the way that people in the system would view me. I wanted those people to view me as I viewed myself, or as the people who knew me best understood me. Yet neither of those perspectives mattered. I had to think about the stakeholders. And I was only learning how, being, how to begin going through life from their perspective. Before going into that first team meeting, I remember thinking about what I wanted. The 40-foot walls that surrounded the penitentiary holding me stifled my energy and creativity. Media reports described the prison as being one of the most violent in the nation. Within the first weeks there, I knew that I would have to make my life in an environment where crimes such as robbery, extortion, rape, and murder would be a normal part of the day. Before that first team meeting, I had heard that the Federal Bureau of Prisons operated prisons of many different security levels. All prisons were not the same as a typical high security prison. The agency also operated federal correctional institutions or minimum security camps. I thought about what I wanted rather than what the system wanted. And during that first team meeting, I asked the members of my unit team if there was any way that I could transfer to one of those other types of prisons. Mr. Santos, the federal judge sentenced you to 45 years. We've placed a public safety factor on you for committing the greatest severity offense. You should expect to serve your entire sentence inside high security penitentiaries. We built these prisons to hold inmates convicted of crimes like you committed. It's kind of the vernacular of prison. From his viewpoint, I was just another cow. 
And when developing a release plan, we must ask a different set of questions than what we want. What questions can we ask to influence how people see us? This brings me to the perspective of another book I read that influenced my thinking. That book, too, would prove valuable in thinking about the release plan we want to develop. I don't recall the name of the book, but I remember the concept. It was called the Jahari Window. With the Jahari Window, people learn to understand their relationship with themselves and with others. Psychologists use the concept of the Jahari Window in self-help groups. Anyone designing a release plan may want to give some consideration to the Jahari Window. Start by thinking of a quadrant with two columns and two rows as follows. We've got one column that is no, known to self and another column that says not known to self. We've got a row that says known to others and another that says not known to others. In the known to self, known to others cell or quadrant, we have the open area. And the open area is that part of our conscious self that we're aware of and that is known to others. Everyone knows about our attitude, our behavior, our motivations, our values, and our way of life. But then there is that other quadrant that says not known to self, but known to others. Like in the Jahari's windows, this is known as the blind spot. The blind spot represents what others perceive in us, but that we do not think about when thinking of ourselves. Then we have the row with not known to others, but known to self. And that is the facade area where we think about the way we consider ourselves, but our peers do not necessarily think about us. They may think we're delusional or that we've got an unrealistic perception of who we are. For example, I think I'm tall and good looking, but my wife doesn't <laughs> necessarily think that. We've got another one that says not known to self, but not known to others. Unknown in this area. This concept may occur that we don't know and that others don't know about us. Who knows what we will be in the days, months, or years, or decades ahead. Now, had I used this concept before my first team meeting, I may have engineered a better strategy to make my request. Perhaps I would have given some thought to questions that could have guided me in developing a more comprehensive release plan. As participants work through the exercise of developing a release plan, I encourage them to think about the people they will meet in the future. For example, consider the person who sits in the role of residential reentry manager. This person typically does not interact with people in prison. This person may never sit across the table from you. If you do not take appropriate steps, the only documents that will influence his opinion of you will be the documents that government officials or media reports may have written about you. So let's use Johari's window to consider questions in developing your release plan. Here are some questions from the open section of the box. In what ways do you see yourself? How or why would the residential reentry manager know this about you? What steps can you take to help the RRM know this about you? And then some questions from the blind section of the window. What motivated the RRM to pursue his position? How does the RRM define success? In what ways does the RRM view you? Then there are facade questions. When the RRM meets with others in his industry, how do they think about people like you? What do you share in common with other people the RRM has to assess? In what ways does the RRM think you are unaware or unrealistic about how you see yourself? And then finally, the unknown questions. What influences your future, what influences in your future are neither you nor your RRM considering? In what ways does your behavior show that you are contemplating such unknowns? And what motivates your RRM to want to deny your request for special consideration? These kinds of questions should drive the development of your release plan. Regardless of whether you are at the start of your journey through the criminal justice system or whether you're well into this path of serving your sentence, you are going to encounter people who do not know you, yet they will make judgments about you based upon what government officials or media reports have written to describe you. The sooner a person starts to contemplate these, contemplate these realities, the more effective the person becomes in designing an effective release plan. 
So let's go to Zig Ziglar and criminogenic needs. We can go back to those six criminogenic needs that staff members in the correctional space learn about through their training. The authors of this book include Faye Taxman, a social scientist with whom I've interacted through my advocacy work. She co-authored a book called Tools of the Trade, a guide to incorporating science into practice. Social scientists and educators have developed volumes of work around this concept, and administrators use those tools to train the people who assess, will assess whether you are a worthy candidate for relief. And for that reason, it makes sense for us to incorporate those concepts into the release plan that we're developing. To paraphrase another author, Zig Ziglar, if you can figure out how to give others what they want, you can get a lot closer to getting what you want. So let's go through those risk factors. Low self-control. The authors link crime to, to an inability to control one's own behavior. People commit illegal acts when they do not have the ability to control their impulses. For example, a person who oversees financial accounts may be more inclined to embezzle or commit fraud if the person lacks self-control. Or a person may be more inclined to use drugs if the person cannot control himself. In what ways does your release plan address this criminogenic need of low self-control? And then we've got antisocial personality. People with antisocial values do not associate with the values and norms of the broader community. They have the mindset of thinking they are different or that rules don't apply to them. In prison, some people think that the best way to serve time is to forget about the world outside and to focus on their time in prison. They surround themselves with others who have criminal thinking patterns. As Shakespeare wrote, they're the people who feel joy by ripping wings off of butterflies. In what ways does your release plan address the criminogenic need of the antisocial personality? Criminal peers. Stakeholders in the criminal justice system believe that when people with a criminal background associate with others who have a criminal background, the risk of criminal behavior escalates people become susceptible to peer pressure. They break the law to fit in. So here's the question. In what ways does your release plan address the criminogenic need of criminal peers? And then we go to substance abuse. Staff members rely upon research to support their position that a relationship between substance abuse and criminal behavior exists. It is the reason that members of Congress passed the 1994 Comprehensive Crime Control Act, which ushered in the RDAP program. I remember when the Bureau of Prisons rolled out that program, and just as the case with the First Step Act, it took many years of advocacy and litigation before the BOP implemented the policy that exists today. To develop an effective release plan, we have to be vigilant in our thoughts about how administrators will view us. So in what ways does your release plan address the criminogenic need of substance abuse? And then finally, dysfunctional family. Stakeholders believe that if a person comes from a family with a long history of criminal behavior, the person becomes more likely to engage in crime. People who come from such backgrounds may have grown up without positive role models. They have, may have never learned the concept of morals or values. They may not view criminal behavior as being destructive to society. In what ways does your release plan address the criminogenic need of the dysfunctional family? The questions above may prove helpful in designing or elaborating upon your release plan. So now I want to just give, because as I was reading there, some thoughts came to mind, and I'm going to turn to this, a couple of these earlier ones, and that one of them is substance abuse. So everybody, most people know that the prison system has well, pre prior to the First Step Act, it only had one mechanism in the federal system through which a person could work toward, um, toward advancing a release date, okay? And that was participating in RDAP. And so everybody wants to learn how do you participate in RDAP, and, and it's important that you learn that if you want to access the benefits of that program. But there's a flip side to that now, because if you've got substance abuse in your criminal history, well, that means that people you're going to meet in the future are going to take that into consideration when assessing your liberty level at, at, at a certain point. So think about that in the future. And there was one other that kind of popped in my head here as I was just going through this. 
Um, I think it was um, low self-control. Was I thinking about that? Or antisocial personality, um, criminal peers. Well, I don't remember what it is now. So I have to elaborate it on the workbook because I will convert this into, you know, one of our workbooks that'll look like this and it'll be available right on the uh, top of our website at Prison Professors. If you look at our books and resources section, and we're always publishing and producing content and people can access it right for free from our website. They can buy a soft cover book from uh, Amazon and there's a link right on our catalog and that shows up on, uh, what's it called? I think it's called... Uh, books and resources um, on the top tab of the of the home page and of course you can get just by subscribing to us on iTunes or YouTube and get it that way but we're really trying to give lessons and information that will help justice impacted people start thinking about how do I sow seeds today for the level of liberty that I want to have in the future and the more I think the more I can train myself to think how the stakeholders are going to think the more effective I'm going to be at building or architecting a strategy that will give me the results that I want. That's a strategy that worked for me. I'm going to be documenting that as part of our release plan workbook uh, because I really want to show people I never ask anybody to do anything that I didn't do. This is what got me through 26 years in prison. It's what helped me uh, emerge with my dignity intact and with opportunities to prosper. I didn't get, get out of prison one day sooner for this, but that's because the First Step Act didn't exist back then. So if you're trying to learn what you can do to empower yourself, these books and courses that we offer at Prison Professors for free, if you just go through our website or watch our YouTube channel or iTunes, they're going to help you help yourself. And that's what's crucial. Learn how to help yourself. Don't think the system exists to help you. In fact, if you, you go through these exercises seriously, like I'm suggesting, you will recognize, yeah, people go into law enforcement, not necessarily because they want to be family friendly to people in prison. They may want to protect you know, society and victims of crime. And there, many will believe that by helping somebody with a criminal background, they're simultaneously hurting somebody who has been a victim of crime. And so we always have to think about those stakeholders and how our decisions um, really impacted, impact those stakeholders and what can we do to architect our way over. So in the next... I don't know if it'll be in the next video, but certainly as part of the workbook, I will describe how I use this in developing my release plan. And remember, these are iterative plans. You can start with one, but you've got to keep developing it over time because that's what the system really expects. So my name is Michael Santos. Again, on behalf of our entire team at Prison Professors, we really want to encourage you to do everything you possibly can to learn how to help yourself I stand behind everything on our website. I'm 100% open and transparent, and I never ask anybody to do anything that I didn't do, and that's what I encourage people on our team to do. So we want you to learn how to help yourself, and on behalf of our team, I really want to thank you. Um, I, want to, I want to encourage you, and I want you to know that we believe in you. So if you're listening to this on iTunes or on YouTube, we encourage you to believe in us by subscribing to us, but if you're inside of a jail or a prison and you're getting this, through one of our DVD programs or one of our relationships with the institutions, I am hoping that you will help us help you because I'm still really obsessed and focused with trying to reinstate U.S. parole and expand the use of good time, expand the use of earned time credits, expand mechanisms that will incentivize a pursuit of personal excellence. So we believe in you. We want you to help us by avoiding disciplinary infractions, participating in the prison professor's programs, and really documenting your journey of preparing for success. I'm Michael Santos, and I thank you for being a part of our community.